Thank you all very much. Um, thank you, uh, American University. Thank you, NEA. You've become like an extended wacky family to me. <laughs> and I'd just like to point out that Joan didn't actually ask two questions. She asked three questions. She said, what is art? How does art work? And what 10 questions can I put in the omnibus survey the census puts out that would allow me to measure this? <laughs> that, I believe, was our first conversation. And uh, thank you all. Um, art leaders from around here, both uh, existing and emerging. I see a lot of students here. I would like to do three things. I'd like to provide a little bit of context, just um, what we sought to do, how we did it. Uh, I'd like to present the simplified map uh, to build on the point that Rocco just made. I will declare right now that it's productively inaccurate. Uh, and I will talk about some of its inaccuracies, and I'll talk a lot about why I think it's productive. Uh, and then. We will take questions. I am not going to sit up here and blast you for 45 minutes. I'm going to blast you for a half an hour. And, but what I'd like to do is really engage you all in a little bit of conversation. Uh, ha have you ask clarifying uh, questions uh, for now and set the tone for the rest of the, the conversation? You know, this is my job. So. Desired outcome. First of all, I'd like, to, I'd like to commend part of the work we did, we did in Asheville. Uh, this picture that you see is from the Asheville mural project, reprint, reprinted with permission of the artist. And the world that we live in, I was able to get the permission last night over the internet. I just, I'm very grateful for that. So we set out to do several things. One was to establish a measurement framework for assessing art's impact over time. Um, we're looking at outcomes. The question is not, it, it really is, what are the, what are the long-term consequences, benefits, not so benefits of art to both individuals and community? And I'll make this statement now. One of the limitations to this is that our investigation was um, exclusively North America, the United States specifically. I have some reason to believe that this would generalize but our focus was the United States. The second thing that we were asked to do was to advance our understanding of the relationship between art and many things that are important to us as citizens and as a community, our, our own well-being, our own quality of life. And we had to unpack that. And that's our quality of life as individuals and quality of life as communities. Some of the, that's cultural as well as economic. These, these cascade and get um, more and more complex, but the underlying thesis and belief going in is that art serves to make us better, healthier, sounder as, a, as individuals in a community, and that in turn feeds back and helps shape and provide opportunity for art. So that was the desired, that was the desired outcome. Uh, the vision of success is uh, coherent, um, Uh, create a uh, framework that captures this dynamic, is uh, coherent, and, uh, and the coherent will be represented in the systems map, and I'll talk a lot about that. I'll actually take you through the map, because I know that until you walked in and picked up the document, you don't know what the heck I'm talking about. So I'll walk you around the map. And collective, uh, it is easy for us to sit in a room with the windows closed and get you know, kind of excited, uh, high on our own exhaust. We decided that that wasn't really the best way to do it. There is a rich and vital research that takes place already. There are communities like, that are filled with people like you. Let's tap into it. Let's understand what you're talking about, how you're thinking about it, and bring people together, and bring people together in a way that provided a diverse set of perspectives, but in a systematic way that allowed us to build this model collectively highlights areas of consensus and areas of difference. Um, one of the first things I did uh, upon taking this assignment from Joan was to read uh, you know, ways of seeing. And I understand that it's a millennial old uh, argument, you know, what is art and who gets to declare it? So some of these tensions, some of these areas of contention 
are well established and well written about. And we tried to create a model that honored those and put them into context. And finally, provides guidance on what and how to measure. And this is where we work very closely with Sunil and his group to make sure that we could uh, refract the current set of research that was being done at the NEA through this framework. And we could point to areas where perhaps ethical experiments could be done or different new um, uh, research might be done as well. We also thought of many unethical pieces of experiment, but we chose not to do them. Like, could you deprive a community of art? I mean, what better way of showing art's impact than de depriving a, a, a community of art? That would be unethical and, in fact, would go against human nature. So the vision of success is this measurement framework. I will present the model, and Sunil will talk about how he's populated it with tools and methods of insight. So in order to do this, in order to take um, Joan's challenge of what are the 10 questions, we had to stand back and say, you can't measure unless you have an objective. And it's awfully hard to have a set of objectives unless you make clear your theory, your personal understanding, your beliefs in what the causes and effects are and how they, they fit with one another. So this is a quote from Paul Brest, uh, Paul Brest wrote this. Uh, it appeared this summer in the Stanford uh, Social Innovation Review special summer issue uh, called um, Risky Business. Uh, it, he's, he's writing, he's the president of the Hewlett Foundation, and he wrote both about the importance of measurement and the need for uh, basing it in theory. And I, I just think I had added emphasis, which got lost here, uh, but I think it's, you know, he, where I have put in decision maker, he had philanthropist. I think this is, I just will assert now that this is a bias that we came into this work, that in order to measure outcomes, you have to have a model as a decision maker as to what the inputs and activities are, what the outputs are, and what those outcomes are. That is a theory of change. Um, and uh, empirically based, um, we went to you guys, we went to the literature and we, we conducted about 75 interviews of various experts to help articulate this theory of change. It was a bad idea to write notes on, a, on loose sheets of paper. Um, so the first step was let's create a theory of change. We had some problems. One is most theories of change read from left to right. Um, you start with a goal or an objective. Uh, you want to allay rural poverty uh, with small household farmers around the world. That's the, you have a set of you have a set of inputs, activities, outcomes. It reads from right to left, but that doesn't happen in the art world. It doesn't happen in this particular system. It doesn't happen in many systems, but the activities feed the very goals. The activities, the outputs come back and become inputs. It's more uh, circular than it is linear. Um, there is also some really fascinating stuff that happens. There, the time delays. There are, you know, pardon me, you are the artists. I am, I am merely a, a researcher pretending to be one here. But there are two, there, there's a set of tangibles, uh, uh, music, um, uh, written work, um, sculpted work, paintings, they exist. This stock lasts forever. You know, Hermes of Praxiteles sits in the Olympus Museum, and it was, it's been in Olympus for two millennium. I was there a couple of summers ago, and I watched this Australian, this young Australian woman come in and swoon. I have to lean up against the wall in the presence of Hermes of Praxiteles. This stock doesn't diminish. It's always there. Then you have um, interpretive music, uh, um, improv improvisational music, or, or improv performance art. It goes away. So you have some stocks that last forever, some stocks that go in a minute. You've got these time delays. Um, you've got changing tastes. Oh my goodness. We didn't even talk about beauty and aesthetics. We will acknowledge them as important influences on the system. Uh, but what is considered art and artistic changes over time. 
uh, the role art plays in society from you know, being uh, uh, a payon to the uh, dominant spiritual belief in a particular community to being a real challenge to the way that we look at things. So we were looking at this picture. And by the way, um, Liz Wickstrom is a, a RISD student, graduated this spring, last spring. She created this on a chalkboard as an assignment, took a picture of it, Instagrammed it up to her uh, blog and Flickr account, and uh, gave me permission to use it. So in some ways, it's also a sign of how the system is changing so quickly and how our very invention and the ability to create new technologies have really changed the way in which art is both made and presented and engaged in around the world across time. So we were looking at something like this and said, oh my gosh, this is what our theory of change might look like. And so what we, what we did is we went to um, the science of systems dynamic and systems mapping. There's a long, rich science of it, Peter Senge, MIT. I have a deceptively simple quote from Danella Meadows up here. A system is an interconnected set of elements that's coherently organized in a way to achieve something. Um, and two points, for those, for those of you who are actually students of systems dynamic. Yes, um, Dr. Meadows passed away in 2001, so it's odd to have a 2008. This, this manuscript was open sourced on the, I'm gonna get it wrong, the National Capitalism Solutions website for free in access to everybody. It was picked up by Chelsea Green Press and published in 2008, which is what's reflected in the 2008. When you look at a definition like this, you can say, boy, isn't everything a system? Uh, no, you know, a pile of sand is not a system. You can take away a lot of the sand and it's still a pile of sand. But we were asking ourselves, can we identify the elements in this system? Can we identify the stocks? Can we, and, and I don't mean just the stocks of art. Can we identify audience? Can we identify artists? Can we identify elements, the nouns that are associated with quality of life? happiness, better health, smarter children, more patents, more money. Um, do the parts affect one another? Well, that was our going in contention. We have some literature to, to support that. The idea was how do you put it into a coherent and simple framework that showed that? Uh, do the parts together produce effects uh, that are different from each of the parts? Um, we contend that yes, that's true. And do the effects persist? Uh, I think that's an easy yes in the course of um, examining the, in, the role of art, the influence of art on quality of life and back. Um, that's it. I'm not going to talk any more about systems theory. Um, no, I'm not going to talk any more about systems theory. <laughs> you are lucky. It is tempting. But that's when I come back. Um, let me tell you a little bit of the evolution of the systems map that I'm about to show you. Um, we interviewed over, we, we, over 75 experts participated in this process. We consulted 150 or so documents or databases or results. We convened two workshops uh, one was in um, Oakland, California. It started in the Oakland Museum, moved to a local foundry, um, and, to a, uh, and then in Asheville. We also uh, went through a number of artist venues, recruiting uh, local artists, um, folks who were involved in uh, the civic life of the community, and uh, a group of experts, panelists, who were... Who, um, uh, came along and were instrumental. And in fact, I, I know there's at least one in the audience, and I just want you to please raise your hand. If there are other participants in that, please also raise your hand. So anyway, Marjorie, thank you very much. She, she was one of about mm, 
20 or 25 people who came together for two-day workshops to, to workshop what do these systems look like. And that's, you know, we, okay. We started with something that was very simple. You know, art influences, uh, has economic, uh, um, creates artifacts. There's some transaction, creates economic value. That contributes to quality of life. It goes up and it provides some fuel for art. Or the negative is you generate artifacts, nothing happens. You become poor and you do something else, lowering quality of life. There's a personal story. We call this the bivalve heart. In the course of our workshop, we decided that was way too simple. To Rocco's point, um, we had oversimplified something that was very complex. Uh, but the, the inputs for this were uh, an extensive lit review and interviews with people who ranged from the head of IDO to um, systems dynamics uh, experts, uh, professors in art management, um, artists themselves, uh, uh, some politicians. It was, it was a wide range of folks. After the, after the first workshop, mm, as you can see, it became quite a bit more complex. Uh, when we saw this one, we called it the apple. Didn't seem quite as dynamic as the heart. Together in, um, in uh, Asheville, we came up with something that was more simple and captured what we thought were the major subsystems and kind of the important domain constructs that should be present in this map. So that was, that was the process. It, it was a collective process. It was built on a lot of good thinking and writing that already exists. It was built on conversation with smart people, some of whom are deeply in the system. Anthropologists talk about the etic and the emic perspective. Etic perspective is you know, those who might come from the outside and look in. Emic are those who are within. It's always best to have both. So we have you know, artists, participants in the system, the, the emic view, as well as some outsiders. So we have a, you know, uh, an atmospheric scientist, a meteorologist, who can help us think about what are the, what are the limits and powers of systems. We had um, physiologists and some cognitive psychologists. That was it. Um, it took a year to do. This was not an easy, you know, despite Rocco and Jones um, trying to close the deal, promise that this would be easy, it was not. And so I, what I'd like to do is show you this thing called the map. And I'd just take a minute, if you would, to look at it. Um, I'm just. I'm gonna. I'm gonna walk around. I'm gonna walk around the map. I'm gonna provide a little bit of definition and explication. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. Um, if I'm saying something that is completely baffling, please shout it out from the crowd, and I will try to replay it back and and be clear. But we're. Let's. We'll put. <laughs> we'll put technology in my hands, and I'll become dangerous. We'll put art at the center of this diagram. And art here is a creative expression that is conveyed through some medium with some skill. So we put already some limits on what is and isn't art. Art's participation, another limit that we put on this is in order for this system, in order for us to be able to actually go around this system at least once, the participation had to be by at least one other person, not the artist. So, you know, there are a, there are a group of people who write or paint and they keep it to themselves. That's really important in terms of defining impact on quality of life at the individual and the community level. We chose to exclude that from our consideration. So, you know, art creation uh, cleverly 
doesn't take a position on what art is. It could be the, the act of creating. It could be the thing created. It could be the entire experience of creating it and engaging in it. But at the center is some creative expressive act that interacts with an audience leading to engagement. So far, so good. This leads to benefits of art to individuals. And um, just to flip ahead, well, no, I'm sorry. I'm not going to flip ahead. These benefits are not always certain. It's not even clear that, they, that there is a measurable, palpable benefit if one person engages one piece of art at one time. Yes, you can have the, uh, you know, the moments of epiphany. I come out of, I'm a, I'm a commercial consultant years. I'm a statistician and psychologist. I've looked at ad effectiveness as part of what I do over the course of my career. I can tell you with 100% certainty that the instantaneous impact of a single advertisement is zero, it, unmeasurable. But we know that if we run a campaign long enough in a community, we can change behavior. That same kind of thinking is here. These benefits accrue. They accrue over time. They accrue over individuals. And over time could be a single individual exposed to many pieces of art. It could be a single individual exposed to the same piece of art. I grew up in New York City. At the time I grew up, back in the Stone Age, the uh, Picasso's Guernica still hung in New York City. And I would go and I'd sit and look at that and think about it in light of the Vietnam War. And I think that, you know, for me, that was repeated exposures to a single piece of art that had some influence on the way I was thinking about things. Um, these, uh, I'm going to not steal too much of the thunder, but we, we, then spent, oops, we then spend considerable time taking apart what are these benefits. There, you know, what are the physical benefits? What are the spiritual benefits? What are the psychic benefits? What are the cognitive benefits? And I, uh, benefit has a positive connotation. <clears throat> Let's be clear that sometimes art you know, again, it's a creative expression. It may be designed to provoke. It may be designed to make you try to make you think about things in a different way. The individual's reaction may not be one of, you know, open arm embrace of the idea. It may actually be anger. We would count that within the notion of benefit. We ourselves had much debate about uh, benefit of art to society and communities. And we've, there are cultural benefits as well as, I'll say, economic uh, benefits. Cultural benefits might be a sense of identity, a sense of, of belonging, um, a growing sense of right to my culture. It could lead to a sense of exclusion as well, but there are, we do believe there are benefits, social, cultural benefits. And uh, the world is spending an awful lot of time talking about the economic benefits of arts. It, it is clear through um, um, the Cultural Data Project, we're tracking what happens in communities where um, artists come and um, uh, settle in an area, attracting other businesses, raising rents, having to flee because they can't afford it, but the gentrification because of their colonization of those. There, are, there is evidence of that, and these play across one another. How many of you in the room are measurement or evaluation people? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. We have taken also the position that arts is, uh, this is a model of contribution, not attribution. And, and by that, I, I just want to be clear, there are many things that can enhance or detract from quality of life. Art is one of them. We are looking to articulate what is the incremental addition that engagement in art can make. The engagement and the benefits of art to individuals and to, and to communities talk back and forth to one another and have influence with one another that can stand separate from the art itself. But I might have a set of experiences collectively as a community, we might have a set of experiences and it can cause some benefits. The art was there as an initial experience, but it's out of the loop. 
it's an important source. It's out of the loop in the sense that it's not in that, ex in that exchange. I don't mean to make it sound like it's irrelevant. These benefit, and so these are the first order. These are the closest in. One of the things that we agreed collectively was it's easier to see what the benefit to the individual or the community in which the arts engagement takes place than it is to see um, the, you know, a direct line from arts participation to these broad social capabilities or capacities that we think are ultimately influenced and you know, art contributes to, but they're mediated by uh, cultural well-being, uh, community well-being, uh, individual well-being. These societal capacities uh, to innovate, to create, and to express ourselves. Um, you will see in a map that uh, Sunil presents, there is a, there's a bubble that, a couple of other bubbles that will appear here. This um, uh, capacity to express shows up both in the invention of new modes of expression, uh, you know, uh, new ideas to ex be expressed, as well as new forms, formats, uh, channels. So again, my ability to be in touch with Liz Wickstrom, um, for her to make her art available to me, which was a classroom project in, in, in Providence, Rhode Island, and make it available so that I can use it here is in some sense a benefit of the society's you know, capacity to invent new forms of communication of which I was a, a, a beneficiary. Before I get up to arts infrastructure and education and training, um, which I know is actually very important here and I, I, I will tread lightly, you know far more about it, I'd like to talk about system multipliers. This system sits in a much broader system and this system is influenced by many things. Um, markets and subsidies. Over the course of time, who pays for art, who has sponsored art, has changed, and it's changing now. And these subsidies aren't necessarily exclusively money, it's also time. You know, who gives time and money? Where does that come from? It is an important fuel uh, within, this, um, within this system. Uh, demogra demographics and cultural traditions uh, easy to write, uh, deceptively complex, especially in the United States where we're trending towards more pluralistic and diverse communities. How do tastes and values reconcile? How are they expressed? How are they embraced? What tolerance or intolerance is shown as witnessed by many of the things that are in, local, in, the, in the recent news? And I touched briefly on space and time. This system has tremendous lags, it can happen instantaneously, or it can take a thousand years for it to take place. One of my favorite you know, thought experiment examples is you have Emily Dickinson writing poems at home alone. And she could have died and we never would have known it. She shared it with this uh, publisher in Boston who published a few edited poems of hers after her death. So the poetry didn't reach us until you know, she was dead. And, it and she and Walt Whitman have changed contemporary poetry, particularly co contemporary American poetry. The time delay in that system is phenomenal. Yet you have a film that was made and posted to YouTube which has inflamed certain portions of the world. And that took a week. So the 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 cadence through this system is very different. And how do you manage that? How do you actually embrace that as part of a measurement model is a real challenge. And I'm glad that Sunil is up for that. Um, societal capacities to innovate and express oneself as well as the individual benefits, our, our belief in, our love of, our desire to engage more in art both come back and contribute to arts infrastructure, which really is uh, time and space and um, opportunity, if, if you will. It's a very important context setting variable, as well as education and training. Training both in terms of uh, being able to produce art, but also in terms of appreciating art. And at the very core, the fuel of this system 
uh, we just we take as an axiom is the, is humans' desire to express. We just have a story that we have to tell, and without that, in some ways, art wouldn't exist. It is the it is the first principle, if you will. So that was a quick walk through the system map. I, I'm I, I'm curious if there are any questions of clarification or amplification I should make that you want to ask at this moment? All right, time's up. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions in just a second. Um, when you look at a system and you say, do we have a good system map? You want to ask a couple of questions. You want to ask, um, is it resilient? Is it adaptive? Uh, resilient we believe that the answer to this is yes. It's resilient in that um, you can trace the, you can tell the story of the Asheville arts experience or the colonization of certain neighborhoods in Oakland and it's the gentrification and the net positive in influence through this map. You can tell, perhaps you could tell your own stories through the map. It's explanatory. Does it have hierarchy? It does, and I, all, I'm just going to flash this and then go back. There is a, a much deeper description of what some of the out, inputs and outputs and activities are within each of these subsystems with some talk about how they talk to one another. So the system that I'm showing you is really the superordinate set. There are subsystems that sit inside it. You know, the same way that our liver and lungs sit inside of us, and we can talk about ourselves as people. We're talking about arts impact, and there are different organs, different subsystems in here. And one of the challenges that Sunil faced was how do you map that? How do you how do you map that? Um, and the I, the last test is. Will this system persist? I, I think if we took away the human impulse to create and express, the system might persist for a while, but it would wind down. As long as we are human, this system will continue to grow and evolve, adapt to market circumstances, cultural circumstances, uh, social circumstances. So the reason I'm saying this is, you know, we went in saying, oh my gosh, there's no way that we can do a linear theory of change. It's just, this is too, there are too many pieces that um, recurse and talk to themselves. We have to think about this as a system. We've created the system and it passes uh, certain tests that say, yes, that this, um, you may not like the picture, but it does, in, it does pass the test of being a system. So I am winding up. So if there are questions, I think that there is a, a, you're going to be asked to speak through the microphone so that the people online can hear what you're asking. Feel free to line up now. Or soon you'll get ready, one or the other. Um, so this map reflects several key truths. Um, uh, Art engagement is at the core. I, that may be a self-evident truth or it may be a self-serving truth, but I do believe it is a truth. When you're, asked to, when you're asked the question, what is the relationship between art and quality of life? It's nice to see that the map has art at its center. Um, the human impulse uh, to create drives this. Um, and I've made, I, I mentioned this in passing, and I'll just say it again. The benefits that accrue to individuals and communities are not equally distributed and are not always positive. So I, I don't, the map is a little bit neutral in terms of the values. I, I don't want you to mistake this as a utopic vision for arts and quality of life. Um, in economic exchanges, in hot art markets, some people make a boatload of money, and a lot of people go broke. There are people who labor for years to write and publish poetry uh, at, you know, to anguish. They struggle. They, they wrestle with their muse. I, you know, I'm married to a poet who's taken 10 years between publications of her books. It's, 
it's not always a pretty happy picture, but it's something she has to do. Um, and art engagement makes important um, contributions to the quality of life. It doesn't cause quality of life, but it can enhance or detract from uh, the elements of, of individual level and community level. Um, the system provides what Keats calls negative capability. Have you guys talk about that here? You know, it's this wonderful thing of not actually having to resolve uh, tensions, but to sit with them. So in this system, it doesn't matter whether art is an artifact, it is the act of creation, or it is the act of engagement that takes place between the artist and the audience. All three of those perspectives are permitted to exist. And which perspective you take will then determine what outcomes you would actually look at. Who gets to choose what art is? Likewise, it does not have to be adjudicated in order for this system to work. The artist can declare its art. The cons the the consumer of that art, the audience can declare its art, or a learned body of others can declare its art. All three of those, and that's, I'm, I'm, now you can hear my John Berger reference coming through, but all three of those perspectives are allowed in this map. There is no privilege. So the question of what is art, um, we were able, I wouldn't say finesse, but we were able to allow it to remain uh, in some state of tension and the choices you make as a researcher or the choices you make as a policy person or the choices that you make in talking about this then affect what are legitimate activities and outcomes, uh, outputs and outcomes that you might look at. Um, this also, uh, uh, again, I'm... I'm, I'm um, belaboring a point, but another tension that exists in the conversation about art, as observed by me, somewhat of an outsider, I got the etic perspective here, is, uh, you know, is it high art, is it low art, Where, how does taste fit into this? Um, and in this system map, it doesn't matter. You could look exclusively at symphonies and the performance of classic, you know, classical pieces of classical music, and you could trace um, sort of a low density participation and you could try to trace what the outcomes are at an individual community level. You could also take contemporary music mashed up, self-produced, put up on the internet right now as art and do the same. And I would contend that the paths, the overarching paths would be the same because the scope of what you consider art might be broader in one than the other, the, where you would see impact and the measurability of the impact would be different. The system does provide an integrative and holistic framework for organizing the research. One of the tests that we made before publishing this was to actually go through the work that the NEA has done already to say, can we see your research here? Where are the holes? Where are the pieces of research that exist as orphans away from this map, have we, have we done this? Um, and because we had the benefit of reviewing existing research on arts and arts impact, we were pretty certain that we would have this outcome when we got here. Uh, and then uh, finally, this is a beginning, it's not an end. I, I am not up here to present, you know, this is the revealed truth uh, and no, it can be no better. Um, it is productively inaccurate. It is a simplification in some, some, in some areas. It may be overly simple. It may, it's a complification in some places. It's productive because it, it allows us to put into relationship a bunch of pieces of research that don't necessarily talk to one another. And it allows us to hold perspectives together and in a balanced way that allows each of those perspectives, in fact, to be true in the course of conversation without diminishing the relationships that are expect in, the, uh, in, the, in the system. And it's inaccurate because whenever you simplify, you drop stuff. And I'm sure there are things that are important that ought to be added, uh, and it's really up to you guys and the NEA and uh, to continue doing it. Questions, please, or I'll go on for 12 more hours.
you might, if you can make it to the mic, I think they would prefer that. That's the disincentive for asking questions. Thank you, Hi, I'd like to go back to the map. Oh, no. Yes. So uh, you have the map, and it's at a pretty high level of abstraction. I'd like to ask what happened, what would happen if you took out the word arts at each point it appears and substituted the word science? Uh, you know, I, yeah, and thank you for, I, I'm not going to try to answer the question, but I can tell you that we, we tried to do that with sports. We didn't, we used another S word, but we, and, and it may be that in the um, domains, the, you know, the, the tokens that represent the subsystems that they wouldn't change, but what changes is what's underneath. What are the benefits? What are the art which ones are most important? How much of them are cognitive and spiritual versus material versus health? So we, we did actually try to do this with sport, fearful of exactly that. This could be so general that anything, you know, you could put almost anything up there. Challenge heard. I found that very provocative, and actually I was sitting here, I'm a choreographer, and I'm so moved by the fact that art is at the core of this humongous project. And what I love about the definition of art that you just presented is that it is so relatable to any human, because whether we desire to create art, we all desire to create, whether it be science, or babies, or homes, and I think that is a huge shift and how I think funders and large organizations are approaching that, and I am so grateful for it as a working artist. I think it's um, gonna change how society views it. So whether we substitute science or art, I am just greatly moved that it is at the core of it, so thank you for that. More questions like that? <laughs> no, thank you. All right. Um, there's not a rush to the microphone, so I'm going to hand off to my colleague, Sunil. Thank you guys very much. And NEA and American University, thank you.